Okay, welcome to the 51st episode of An Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Craig Wiener and Suzanne Fagel. Uh, Suzanne is a certified counselor, spiritual director, cranial sacral therapist, somatic trauma release educator, and EFT and matrix reimprinting coach. She has been educated the educating those in the helping professions about working with people with trauma and stress for the past 10 years and has been an educator of somatic practices and the neuroscience of trauma for over 10 years and then dr craig wiener has spent over 35 years working in the fee the healthcare uh, field he is a certified and accredited advanced practitioner and eft master trainer of trainers is also a trainer of Matrix Reimprinting, co-director of the EFT Tapping Trainer Training Institute, and the co-director of the Tapping Out of Trauma Continuing Education Trainings. He is the co-producer and director of the film The Science of Tapping. He is a popular lecturer and podcast guest, and together with his wife and partner Alina Frank, are the creators of the podcast EFT Nation. He is profoundly interested in the underlying emotional and physical connections that stem from adversity and trauma, as well as the facilitation of the transformation of trauma to post-resilience and post-traumatic growth. Welcome, Craig. Welcome, Thank Susan. you for having me. Yeah, thank you. So I first came across your work, I think it was a, a number of years ago, uh, possibly when I was um, doing my EFT training um, in about 2011, 2012. And then recently you sent out an email because I'm on your email list um, with an interview with someone in Ukraine going out doing the EFT work there. And I was like, it was the synchronicity. It was like, oh, I'd love to have you guys on the podcast. So, um, yeah, thank you for agreeing to speak to. Very welcome. My pleasure. So how I'd love for you to begin is just to share a bit about your journey. How did you get both get into the work? You, you now do and it can be as long or as short I just I love the human connection so I find that's always fascinating would you like to begin Suzanne sure um uh, my involvement in this work is very personal um in 1995 um when I was living in the Caribbean um I was in a hurricane um that was so devastating that it destroyed my entire house and I almost lost my life. And um in their reco in recovering from that I had the great good fortune to um meet one of the at that time some a therapist in a very small group of people who were beginning to do somatic work. Um, this person had been uh, working with Peter Levine and then left and founded her own um, program. And so I worked with her um, for a long time, personally working through the trauma of the hurricane and then um, was so fascinated by the work. And I was already a cranial sacral therapist. So I was very interested in the body and the somatic piece. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to train with her. So I trained with her. And then I subsequently trained with a German somatic trauma trainer by the name of Johannes Schmidt, Dr. Johannes Schmidt. And um, so I trained with him for a number of years as well. So that's how I got into it. And then one day Craig and I were talking because we both live like five miles from each other. And so, um, and, and somehow the idea of tapping out of trauma was born out of our conversation. So that's my story in a nutshell. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know about the, the hurricane. Thank you for sharing. And uh, the thing that I would say the most is what was so impressed me is like when I first got, uh, was able to get out of the Caribbean, which was like, four months later that's how bad it was you couldn't move yeah. um and got out of that i would where i was now here on woodby island in the pacific northwest i would see a leaf on a tree just in the breeze go and it would trigger me mm -hmm. or a blue tarp or the or any kind of wind 
And um, what was so incredible to me was that by the time I finished working with Sharon, I, I love standing out in a windstorm. So it really, really took the trauma away. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So that's me. Thank you, Suzanne. Wow, that's mm -hmm. a powerful story. Mm. And, and Craig, what about some of your journey? Mine, differently than Suzanne's, I would say began professionally uh, and then became more personal. So yeah. it's kind of a, a mirror to Suzanne in the sense of... Um, I've um, worked with bodies as a, as a body worker and as a chiropractor for over 30 years and was always interested in various mind-body approaches and, and would have uh, visiting uh, pre-podcast live in-person visiting lecturers to have these discussions with back, back in the day <laughs> and did that for many years. Um, and so I was always interested in being exposed to different healing methodologies and interested in them. Yeah for curiosity, for personal growth and for my patients, et cetera. And, um, and so then I had heard about this, um, this EFT thing mm -hmm. online. I was quite skeptical because at the time it was being promoted as try it on everything and it's good for everything. And anything that I hear is good for everything I think is maybe good for nothing. Anyway, so I, so I was skeptical at the beginning and I just um, ignored it. And so I always, it's funny, I always say when people are talking about their methodologies and they, um, they're concerned about skeptics, I say sometimes skeptics become the greatest raving fans and I'd be included. So at any rate, there was, there was a poignant moment. I won't go too deeply into it, but I decided, you know what? I really don't know much about the CFT tapping thing. And I looked around on our little island to see if anybody was doing this. And there was one person who was at the time. And I invited her to the office to discuss it and to see about possibly doing a presentation. And I just named the talk the transformational dialogues and um, and certainly that evening transformed my life um, because I ended up not only entering this field, but ended up marrying that person as well. Um, and so my life changed dramatically, of course. And what I would say is that that's how I reached and then I took an EFT training, um, you know, went in whole hog, started to learn more, ended up assisting in trainings, becoming a trainer. And, you know, the last 10 years have been very dedicated to this work. And in that time, um, the interest in trauma started to grow. And of course, the recognition of my own personal history of trauma combined with that and, and those wove together. Um, my interest um, in the science and the neuroscience um, has always been there, but just deepened. So I feel that um, the interest, the personal history of trauma coming together with the professional interest, together with the science background, and together with that of the love of being a teacher and an explainer and a connector um, has woven together into the work that we do together. So that's a, a, a snapshot. You. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I, I'd heard of Alina uh, through the Facebook communities, and it was only when I was on your website recently. It was like, oh, they're married. How oh, beautiful. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. So, yeah, I think I, I there's something I really love about hearing personal stories because then I can really see, ah, this is how it's healed. That's how it's helped you. It's like EFT. I first did an EFT course in 2000 and I was deeply just troubled at the time I'd been working in the city had had a breakdown and I was trying to find a solution and I came across EFT and yeah it was there was the the gamut points all of these different kind of the early stages and I think as well maybe I was quite skeptical being a very I'd worked in the city in London financial sector when I had my breakdown so I was very analytical but somehow I, yeah, I kept coming back to EFT over the years uh, and I found it to be very profound. So I guess what I'd love for us to move into now is just to talk a little bit about trauma, please. You know, what is it and what are some of the symptoms of trauma? Should we begin with you again, Suzanne? Um, sure. <laughs> 
Um, the first thing I would say about trauma is it's a spectrum. Hmm. Okay. So you can have everything from a very small trauma to an overwhelming, to a trauma that's very big and large in one's life, like my hurricane, the hurricane I was in, um, a, a small trauma. Um, but no matter where you are on the spectrum, the definition with trauma, and there are several, is that it's overwhelming, you feel alone, you feel unable to um, resolve whatever it is has happened, and um, and it leaves a trace in the body that um, that needs to be removed in order to resolve the trauma. So the other thing I would say that's important about trauma is it comes in through the body, and it goes out through the body. Mm. And so, and so many people think that just talking it through and, and stuff, you need to work with the somatic or body element of trauma in order to clear it. Um, and um, so I'm just going to stop right there and let Craig jump in on sure. definition of trauma. Yeah. Um, I like many of the elements that she said. Um, and to be honest, there are many definitions of trauma. Yes. Um, so, I mean, you have ones from the World Health Organization, from the psychological. So, so there's no one. Uh, I, what I like that she spoke about is that trauma first is defined by one's experience of what happened. One's perception of what happened, the elements of surprise, um, the largeness of the emotional response, the resources that one has in the moment to overcome the experience, um, the elements of helplessness and feeling isolated and overwhelmed. Um, all of these happen, for example, in what we call shock trauma moments. In the EFT world, we often use the acronym um, UDIN, that it's unexpected, dramatic, isolating, and no resources to be able to overcome it, depending on age and size and all the different elements of that. But I'd say really, you know, trauma can also sometimes be defined as something that happens over time with abandonment or so. So there's shock single element trauma, there's other types of trauma. And what I would what I want to add is um, nobody can tell us whether we experienced it. We, we know that and it's our experience. It's often minimized as we are adults because when we look through an adult's eyes at something that happened when we were young, we minimize that it wasn't that bad, but we forget what the experience was like for the individual. And you know, I certainly know that that's probably relevant to many of your listeners when you talk about boarding school trauma, depending on age. We can look back now and go, oh, kids were just kids. They were just bullies. That's the way they are. And we, you know, we have a very different perspective later on that we didn't then. And I'd say the most important element that really is coming to define trauma is the ongoing effect on one's life, mm -hmm. right? That it has persistent residuals that continue in the way that we see the world, act in the world, behave in the world, make choices in the world. So there's a start. Mm, thank you. The ongoing effect on the world, yeah. And mm. that will also in, in part um, be an indicator of how severe the trauma is as well. Because the more areas of your life that you are unable to function mm. in, the more grand the trauma. And and when you say the symptoms of trauma later, you know, we have the immediacy of the acuteness in the moment, perhaps, but one might say, okay, how does that show up 30 years later? And it can show up in innumerable ways. It can show up by how I view what I deserve as far as a career, financial relationship. It can show up on my perception of safety in the world with people alone in public places, in different situations. It can show up in physical effects. The long-term physical effects of trauma are quite researched. Um, longevity, behaviors, addictions. Um, you know, the, um, one of the 
not exact quote, but uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, who's, um, as you know, quite well known, once said, and I remember reading it and it threw me for the moment. He said, trauma so invades and affects who we are that it affects even the clothes that I choose to wear in the morning. And at the beginning, I thought that's a little ridiculous, don't you think? I mean, really, it's like, I just like this or that. I, those are the choices I have until you start to realize, well, do I choose tight fitting clothing that shows off my body? Do I choose baggy clothing that hides that? Do I show bright colors that draw attention to me? Do I choose dull colors that don't draw? So when we think about the, the fingers of trauma that show up on how I sleep, the fingers of trauma of my relationship, my work, my friends, my, my personality, my behaviors, um, it affects it all. Um, so there's no um, finite list of symptoms and signs that trauma can have its um, effects on as an adult. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely resonate with many of those things as you share about sleep. You know, quite a lot of my clients ex mm -hmm. struggle to sleep because they're in an open dormitory from age six and yeah can't sleep without you know some earplugs things over the heads it's like yeah they're still holding on to that um so yeah. mm, thank you um yeah i mean i you've kind of gone into that a bit how might trauma show up in adults you know is there anything in particular that you would go because I know it's difficult. I know Peter Levine talks about that a bit of, in his book about healing trauma, about symptoms. Are there specific things that you've noticed in your practices which does show up? If someone sometimes, because sometimes people say to me, they'll present with symptoms, but it's not because they think it's anything to do with trauma. Yeah, that's very common. Yeah, very that's common. very common. Um a thing for myself, um, the first thing I'm looking for is physical symptoms because they're the most revealing without somebody really being cognizant of them. So, you know, is there a draining of color? Is there a rapid heartbeat? Is there a change in breathing? Um, you know, I'm looking for that kind of thing, but even more obviously, where are they sitting in the room? Are they comfortable? Do they, you can tell by body language if somebody feels safe and comfortable where they are. So just, be, just even as the client's walking in the door, there's things like that that I'm really looking for. Okay. So, I mean, but then there's cognitive, you know, there's like a lot of different behaviors, there's cognitive or beliefs that they may be holding that you can go. Mm -hmm after a while, whoa, something's, something's behind that. Right. Um, there's physical symptoms in terms of their own wellness in their body. you know, apart from what I'm noticing here, you know, are there, what patterns are, are they, you know, talking about in their life and also what areas of, you know, you know, are they talking, they, they come in around relationship, for instance, then it's like, okay, what's going on underneath that? And you could say, well, I mean, you know, everybody has their stuff around relationships or whatever. But the point is, almost always the issue in a relationship comes from an earlier traumatic experience. And it yeah. doesn't have to be a great big, big T trauma. Mm -hmm. But if there's a pattern in one's childhood and one as a kid had to respond in a particular way in order to stay safe, that's going to play out in a relationship. Yeah. So, you know, you're kind of looking at the overall environment and, and, and body language of the person that's coming in. And it's not, um, and what it is might not be evident immediately or even for quite a while, actually. You know, because they may come in to work on something like how to stand up and give a speech without being terrified or something like that. And you may be working through whatever's going on in terms of their response to that, to having to give a report in public until you get down underneath. What is it that set that terror off in the beginning? Mm 
So, you know, you, it, it just, everyone is, every single person is different. Yeah. And what I like that you said is, I think in my experience, one's, one's relationship to the ongoing effects of trauma for some people are more obvious. They were very clear. I was beaten as a kid and, yeah. you know, I mean, some people have made very conscious connections, but most often much of it hasn't been connected and it's a weaving together of the pieces during their lifetime as an adult that there's deeper and deeper appreciation for the connections during their therapeutic adventure, whatever that looks like in the healing in their lives. Um, I know for me it was, I, I could tell you the things that were adverse in my childhood, but the depth to which they affected the who I amness and how I amness in the world is a continual uncovering. So for me, once understanding a relationship with trauma never ends, um, it's a continual deepening and appreciation of who and how I become in the world resulting from that. Um, and I think also, um, again, the minimizing. So, you know, I know um, a lot of your audience, um, because you have a focus on boarding school and, and perhaps in this audience, more than many, many are men, um, which in most of podcasts and discussions of this isn't the case. So it's, it's nice to have that here. I guess a personal element for me was the realization many years in the theme and importance and significance of the feeling of safety. And not just physical safety, I, I, I mean on a deep level of the experience of being safe and the ubiquitous effects of not feeling safe from how one is in one's body as a chiropractor to have a soft belly and feel relaxed in any situation um, and being okay with feeling safe as being important, which I minimized for many years. Like, why, why does that have to feel so important? I kind of felt like that was you know, for lack of a better word, don't be such a baby, you know, it's kind of a way that I would think of it. It's like, you have to feel safe, you know, and that element of minimizing the importance of safety um, pervaded my life for many years and was supported in a previous relationship. It's like, look, fuck up, right? Kind of an attitude. And yet without safety, healing doesn't readily happen. And um, so, Part of, I, I know you were going to ask about too, how this affects my, my own trauma, how that affects others around me. Mm -hmm. For example, is if I'm not feeling safe, anytime I'm in relationship with somebody that my perception is not feeling safe, I'm more reactive. I'm more defensive. I might be more attacking in order to, so I'm having lots of behaviors and ways of being with those around me, my, especially my intimate or family relationships of which I'm responding and acting from a place of trauma and not realizing it because it's been a survival instinct. It's been an adaptive response. So it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. There's just a reason why I respond that way and I shut down and I need to leave or I act out or I defend or I judge or any of those things. So yeah, trauma doesn't stay with the individual who's been traumatized um, by any chance. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's an important element of our relational experience for those of us that, which is most people that have experienced trauma, how we interact with others is key. Mm. Thank you. That's really beautiful, both of you. Thank you. Yeah. I noticed that a few weeks ago, I was going off uh, to London to do a, a conference about boarding school and I was filming, starting to do a film about the impact of boarding school on our leaders in the world and that week before it was like all of those symptoms i was a bit defensive and i was like oh what's going on here and it's like ah yeah because i'm triggered it's like one of the things we learned was not to speak up you don't speak up or share what you're going through you you take it you know it's all within so yeah i really and that thing of safety again you know as you, you, you know for me boarding school or trauma i didn't feel safe did not feel safe uh i was in fear most of my my childhood it was only later on i think i i spent my 20s in a buddhist monastery i felt that safety and when i did i fell apart and i started to cry couldn't stop crying for about two years so i really resonate with that craig thank you um hmm 
So I would love for you to, I mean, the, the, the third question really was about how trauma might affect those around them, which you've spoken about. I guess I'm interested in, because that's where the film is going to, is about what if these position people are in positions of power? Because we sometimes talk about, oh, if your parents were traumatized, then that's going to affect the children. How would it be if our leaders are traumatized? How would that then impact? <laughs> Craig and I are both thinking the same thing. And, I, and I'll just say it because it's been said all over our US media. Donald Trump was really, really traumatized as a kid. Yeah. You know, so there's one example. And I, you know, I've heard some things about Putin as well. Mm. So I, you know, what what I guess I'm trying to say is many of our world leaders were either bullied or traumatized as kids. And this is the defensive behavior that allows their their um you know, personality or their ego to stay intact and functional. And and given what it takes to be, you know, this is this is not with judgment, but given the amount of effort, energy, and focus that it takes to become a world leader, it means probably not a lot of time was focused on healing their past trauma. And the trauma that happened, you know, we all adapt to trauma. It's all an adaptive response. And so if we understand that many of our world leaders have experienced trauma, as most of us have, then it's a journey to healing that. And when their focus is on other things, often their actions and decisions and worldviews are based on the trauma they experienced. And they then have and create a morphic field in the world as we would talk about a matrix re-imprinting that then may be based on fear, for example, and we can see, and that also results in real anatomical and physiological changes. There are many studies that show how that affects, how trauma affects the brain, which then has an effect on our choices, which then has an effect on our decision, which then has an effect on our attitudes, which then has an effect on, especially if we're in a place of power and we can mandate or promote a particular viewpoint. And I'm not talking about any viewpoint being right or wrong at this point, but that's the lens. Mm. A trauma lens is how we see everything through. Mm. And to overcome that takes attention and healing for anybody. I don't care if you're the head of a country or you're just you and I. Same. We're all human. But what is also very interesting is looking at world leaders who have been revered and I mm -hmm. think, I mean, the first person <laughs> that comes to my mind is Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. who suffered horrendous trauma. Mm -hmm. But there was something in him that, you know, my guess is, and I mean, I'm totally making this up in one sense, but I mean, in the sense that I don't know mm -hmm. uh, factually, but my guess is he had a pretty secure childhood. Mm -hmm. That he was probably loved by his parents and held by his community and that gave him an inner resilience to be able to deal with what life dealt him later mm. also and this i feel is really important too although not i don't know many people talk about it is his faith and what that has to do for me is another definition of trauma that is maybe not so uh, widely out there, but is really important to me and the work that I do with people. Trauma in a way is when you lose a piece of your soul. And Nelson didn't lose his soul. So he was able to be resilient enough to deal with what life dealt him and then you know became the president of south africa and that's an example of a really amazing leadership mm -hmm. you said something really important and it also goes aligned with things dr mate has said is you know trauma everybody looks to the experience of the circumstances of trauma 
not naturally so, whether it be a fire, earthquake, sexual assault, whatever it is. But as he would say, trauma isn't what happened to you. Okay, it's not what happened to you. It's what happened as a result inside of you, which is often the separation or disconnection from self. Right. Another way of saying you lose a piece of your soul. Very right. way to say that. So it's not so much here because two people could be in an alley and attacked, right? And one person has a black belt and it becomes a, a story they tell and another person, their life is never the same. So that inner resilience, the resources we talked about, but what I like that idea of it, it matches very well if we talk about matrix reimprinting at all, is that a part of me separates and disconnects mm -hmm. from me. And so the healing from trauma is about that, that reintegration and bringing myself back to whole again when parts of me have been separated or cut off. It's the creative part of me, the spontaneous part of me, the, the willing and at ease of feeling vulnerable part of me. It's the faith part of me that can trust in people in the world. Those parts get disconnected um, from trauma. And again, the healing from trauma is about the reintegration of those pieces or those parts of ourselves. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah, thank you for bringing in Nelson Mandela. I did read his book, A Long Walk to Freedom. And he talks about his childhood and he had initiation as well. Into yeah. The tribe of, of men. Um, so, right. So he's really held by his community. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, thank you. Yeah. That's useful to see because I, I just received a paper from one of the leading psychologists who ba was trained in Yale, but now is based in the UK. He just sent it to me today. I was just reading through about attachment and how going off to boarding school, which so many of our leaders have been. And I've mentioned this quite a few times in the podcast. Uh, I was vis visiting Nick Duffel, who is the founder of the boarding school survivors, boarding school syndrome movement. And he was speaking to him a month two or two ago and he just received an email from a lady saying that 52 out of 92 of the current world leaders have been to not only boarding school, but English boarding school. <laughs> and that separation David Cameron, age seven, you know, Boris Johnson, age 11. So many of these have had that separation where they didn't have that security. And yeah, uh, so thank you. That's really powerful. I hadn't really looked at it like that, Suzanne. So, mm. and Well, and I would also venture to say that if those people were sent off to boarding school, the attachment, the lack of attachment didn't start there. It started much earlier. Uh, many of them come from wealthy families where they had nannies and the parents did not particularly attach mm -hmm. securely to the kids in the first place. And then the final betrayal is like, yo, boy, I, not only have I not been able to do anything right in front of you, for the first nine or 11 years of my life. But now you're like, that's it. We're getting rid of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the interesting thing is the nannies are then fired at that point. The attachment figure is then right. You're right. <laughs> so if there's any attachment at all, it's to the nanny. And you will often hear people say that. Yeah. Yeah. We have a leader in this country who still campaigns. He's in his 40s, possibly 50s with his nanny. You know, from childhood. Well, that's really interesting. That it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'd love now to to go in a little bit into EFT and matrix reimprinting. We've got about 20 minutes. And I'd yeah, I'd love because I love both of these uh these tools. I use them every day. And yeah, so I'd love you to explore and explain what is EFT and what is matrix reimprinting. Sure. Um, EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques. Um, it's used around the world, spoken of as tapping, though many different modalities of the world can use percussive finger tapping on the body that's not EFT. So they're not the same, but often it's referred to that way because we're 
stimulating different acupuncture points that are on the surface of the skin while we're having our brain tune into specific and brain and body turn into specific thoughts, feelings, memories, etc. as we're stimulating and regulating the system by percussively tapping on different points that are close to the surface of the skin. Okay, so it often starts on the side of the hand yeah. while we're saying, well, we're tuning into a problem, even though right now, um, thinking that I'm really nervous about the podcast coming up with Pierce and I'm feeling all this anxiety in my body and I feel it right. So I can tune into whatever the, uh, the negative situation is, so to speak, negative, um, that I'm attending to and tuning my focus of my mind into whether it's something that I'm feeling now, tuning into something that's coming up in the future, tuning into something that happened in the past. And as I'm doing that, that this tapping is providing regulating signals to deep parts of the brain that can start to, through the tapping, release and decrease the cortisol flooding of my body, can slow down my brain waves, can calm the neurophysiology of my body as I'm tuning into this. So I'm simultaneously thinking about something upsetting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while I'm sending very positive signals neurophysiologically through my body so that I can have a renewed relationship with feelings, thoughts, memories, worries, et cetera. And so EFT, you know, since the mid eighties has continued to develop more and more research. Um, there's meta analyses for its effectiveness for, for PTSD, anxiety, depression. There are clinical, you know, there are over 60 clinical studies now for pain, um, for phobias, for um, relationship to one's body and food and craving and weight. So it, it goes on and on. I, I won't go into that too much right now, but there's a lot of published research. And that's why we developed the film to highlight that. Um, and so two different variations, although that's oversimplifying it, one is how to be able to self-apply EFT as you were speaking of, um, so that people can have this grounding, calming tool, the self-regulatory tool that they can use in any variety of circumstances. And when starting to move toward working with trauma, I'm not a recommender for a trauma informed safe place for one to work on their own traumas. That part of creating safety is being with somebody else therapeutically that provides and holds a safe place while we dig deeper into that those adverse memories, for example, and sensations and feelings and thoughts. And so that's when one should work with a certified accredited practitioner and sometimes a licensed practitioner, depending on the severity that this has affected their lives, their emotional state, psychological state, um, et cetera. So we see EFT as a self-help tool mm -hmm. and we see EFT as a therapeutic tool to work with a trained practitioner. That being said, and then just to briefly add on, matrix re-imprinting was developed by one of the original um, EFT uh, master practitioners, Carl Dawson, mm -hmm. who's in the UK and Brighton area. Um, and what that did was that built on um, and included and expanded on EFT in such a way that the best way that I could speak about matrix reimprinting or matrix reimprinting EFT uses EFT, but it also integrates other aspects that some might say looks like, sounds like parts work, mm -hmm. timeline work, um, includes elements of neurolinguistic programming and other things so that what one does is in a safe way, one starts to consider and imagine and take into account one's younger self and start to interact with that younger self uh, using questions, using tapping, using a variety of ways to get at the source of one's trauma, the beliefs and decisions that were made and resourcing and providing another way for this person to have a relationship with that disconnected traumatized part to be able to more quickly, um, more easily and um, really more inherently understand what they went through, what was learned and integrate that so it doesn't have the ongoing post-traumatic residuals that it would normally have. So part of the healing journey, certainly not going to say EFT matrix reimprinting are the only ways to heal trauma. They're not, they're just two very effective ways. Um, and, um, and when done well, safe, gentle and, and very quick, many different therapists and psychologists that we train that have used other techniques over the years 
um, to be honest, become converts because they see the, the gentleness and the quickness with which uh, much of this work can happen um, using these techniques. So I hope that gives a little bit of a synopsis. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Craig. Do you like to add anything, Susan? Yeah, I would like to add that <clears throat> one of the things that's really important that uh, comes out of Carl Jung's work is, and that is very much applicable to e uh, to Matrix, well, EFT, but especially to Matrix, is the use of active imagination and the importance of imagination to be able to actually rearrange <clears throat> thoughts and beliefs um, in into a more positive way. Because one of the things that is true in working with trauma is that people feel somehow that they're damaged or they're wrong or there's something wrong with them. And, you know, one of our tasks in working is to do some neuroeducation, which is to say, your brain is doing exactly what it's meant to be doing. It's actually helping you. It may not feel that way now, but at the time of that, whatever happened, happened, it saved you mm -hmm. because it did what mm -hmm. it knew how to do to protect you. Mm -hmm. And so many people come in feeling on top of being damaged from the repercussions of the trauma, feel that there's something wrong with them, that they're bad, that they can't. And one of the things that's so wonderful about these techniques is that it really helps to turn that around so that one can at least have a favorable view of oneself. And it's mm -hmm. that pause, that switch from the discomfort to feeling actually comfortable and understanding that actually, you know, your brain did exactly what it was supposed to do is very helpful and comforting to many people. Thank you. Okay. And also to say, in some ways, a matrix is, is like is almost like doing a shamanic soul retrieval. Yeah, that's interesting. I've just been piecing those things together. I trained in shamanism about fifteen years ago for a number of years, and oh yeah, that's what this is what's happening. Please, yeah. So I would just say it's another form of soul retrieval in that respect. Yeah. Because you're working with the positive, you're working to shift to more positive viewpoint and belief system. Mm -hmm. And when you're able to do that, it's very relieving, not only to the nervous system, but to the person's personality. It's like, oh, maybe I'm not as damaged as I thought, or there's hope. Wow, things can shift. And then the resilience kicks in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. My wife has been saying to me, which I've added this into this idea of gold as well. What's the gold that this part brings back? What's the gold mm -hmm. from this story? A bit like Jung mm -hmm. or even Robert Bly talking about going down to the depths or Joseph Campbell coming back with the gold, the boon. And it's like, oh, I, I love how all of these bits piece together. It's exciting. Yeah. Gary Craig, <laughs> the founder of EFT, used to talk about the garbage and the gold and how do we reaccess the gold. And some would say the post-traumatic growth. We all went through this trauma. It significantly affected who we are. Mm -hmm. how, how, how are we genuinely able to heal <clears throat> the pain and suffering, have compassion for self and be able to take the wisdom, make sure you leave, leave the pain and suffering behind and use the wisdom moving forward is a, is a big part of this work, I think. Mm, lovely, lovely. So I'm going to do something slightly different here because we've got about five, about seven, eight minutes before we'll start drawing to an end. Is there anything that is top of your consciousness at the moment that you would love to share about trauma, about your work? Uh, you know, anything that you're like, oh, as I've been speaking. Otherwise, we'll go back to the, some of the other areas. But I'm fascinated. Well, two things that go come ahead. to my mind. One is that as much as we um, do admire the fact that EFT and Matrix can work rapidly, is to take into account whatever the trauma is and that, A, we can only go as fast as the slowest part of us feels safe to go. So again, that safety factor is paramount. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, not to, I think, you know, certainly for the practitioners who are not as experienced, the tendency is to think that if they can't fix it in two or three sessions with somebody, then, you know, there's something wrong with them or something. But sometimes it takes a long time, a long time to resolve a trauma. And I, in my own personal um, belief is that we never fully resolve a trauma. That you can come back years later and go, something will trigger you and you'll be like, oh my God, I thought I was over this. You know, and there's one little aspect that we never hit, you know. Um, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing that says we, I mean, to me, it's like, we don't have to be perfect. Right. And um, to me, a, you know, a meaningful life is working on our growth all the time, you know, continue. So, you know, that's, it's not a, a bad thing that this happens, but I think that a lot of people, especially with people who are, have developmental or complex trauma it's a long, slow road to recovery. Mm -hmm. It's it's certainly fun. It works, mm -hmm. but to expect that something that is ongoing in childhood for a long time can be fixed in five or six sessions, no. Mm -hmm. So, and part of that is because what is broken, in, especially in those kinds of trauma, is the attachment. So if you don't have that secure attachment in the first place, um, then part of the job of working with somebody with this material is to reestablish or establish in the first place a secure attachment. Okay. And so that takes time, but it is the most important thing you can do when working with trauma mm -hmm. to establish that safety will in the end make things go much faster when you actually start working on the trauma. But it can't be done by oneself. And Craig mentioned this earlier. There, you know, you can certainly learn tapping as a way of calming the nervous system. But to try to work on your own trauma by yourself, just tapping, no, because the issue is what's missing is the attachment piece. And the the job of the therapist or the coach is to be that person who is stable and there and present and holding the space for you to do the work and without that you're not going to resolve anything so i mean that's that's sort of one of the takeaways that i that i would emphasize again and again and and i Add to that what often is the unrecognized secondary long lasting life affecting aspect of this is one might look to the trauma of one's childhood or past and what dad did, what the teacher did, what the mom did, etc. And there's that trauma piece and that trauma history that often needs resolution and healing of the facts of what happened. How could they have done that? They, the betrayal of trust, the, um, the disconnection emotionally, all, all those different things. One can heal that, but a big part of that that often goes recognized is the connection to the decisions and core beliefs of the way that I now view the world. So in other words, I could heal that dad broke my glasses in a metaphorical way, but on but my glasses now affected how I saw everything after that. Mm -hmm. So the trauma then affected my first relationship because I chose poorly because I didn't think I deserved anything better than that. That then had its effects. And then I chose another person similarly. And then I moved toward a way of self-soothing behavior because of the pain of that. So in other words, the ramifications that have gone on are far become distant though originating in that original trauma. And often the theme that connects the string light of the Christmas lights, so to speak, is the belief of what one decided about who one is or what one deserves in the world, for example. And so a big part of changing the way that my life looks 
isn't just about healing that event that happened when that broke my view of the world through my glasses, etc. Um, but what I then internalized about who I believe myself to be or the world to be or the way things are or not. And so that's a very big part of the work because that's the that's what keeps living. Mm -hmm. And going back to where Suzanne started at the very beginning, one way to look at traumatic origins or the effect of how trauma could, is affecting my life currently is what are the repeating patterns? You know, what are the repeating patterns or, you know, as Freud called the compulsion to repeat the trauma, why does this keep happening to me? Why do, despite my best efforts, everybody I show up with ends up being addicted to something? Why is it that they end up starting off nice but turn mean? Why is it that people continue to leave me? Why is it? And if one can be outside of the suffering, it's like, okay, why is, why is that? And, and become curious then there's almost always trauma at the origins of that pattern, almost always. Um, and when one is feeling ready and safe enough to explore that and heal that in whatever way that looks, um, that's, that's the journey. But I think the thematicness of the recurring themes are often, um, as a detective, a, a beginning place to start that trauma often lies at the origin of. Mm, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful. I can really relate to my own life, seeing those common beliefs that I took forward and then through this work I've started to mm -hmm. unpick. But yeah, the why me, that was a common mm -hmm. thing. Screaming at Scott, why me? Yeah. So yeah, I can resonate with that. So we are coming towards the end. Um, a big thank you to you both. I really enjoyed today's conversation. Mm -hmm really helped me to understand more and hopefully my listeners as well about trauma, about how we heal and uh, your work with matrix reimprinting and EFT. How do people find out more about you? Um, for Word of mouth. me, well, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, on one hand, we go ahead. Go ahead, Suzanne, please. I was just saying word of mouth. <laughs> word of mouth. Great. <laughs> um, well, I, I actually, I guess I misheard the question. So, you know, we, we, we've been in business and practice for a long time. And so it's easier to find out, um, you know, things that um, we've created um, for the public, efttappingtraining.com, our website for EFT trained people is tappingoutoftrauma.com. Um, on our website, you can find EFT Nation. Um, you can look on everything EFT tapping training from TikTok to Instagram to Facebook. And we have a community. Actually, that's the best place. Um, um, community EFT training. It's a platform um, that we have. So there are lots of different ways um, to find us, to reach out. I, I do consultations for clients or, or referrals. And at the EFT tap, Craig at EFT tapping training .com is the best way to reach me um so lots of ways for me suzanne yeah well that's what i said we're very different in that way for me it's word mm -hmm. of mouth <laughs> well i mean and plus being you know <laughs> being uh, seen on the on the eft at uh, tapping on training.com but um yeah most of my referrals either come from people who've trained with us or um word of mouth mm -hmm. I like that. That's really beautiful. Well, thank you so much to both of you. And I'll put links into the bottom of the description on all the platforms. So, you know, I've got EFT tapping training.com. I've got tapping out of trauma.com um, and word of mouth. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work. You can welcome to speak to me and I'll speak to Suzanne. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Beautiful work you're doing. I really honor you for this leading edge work and you know as i say to all of my guests if i can support you in any way with anything please do let me know and i, I received a message from conrad today saying oh i received a, a message back from craig so thank you for you know sharing that thing about the um the study over in belgium because i think he's doing now great work there in those medical um institutions uh, yes he's uh, yeah he's actually working and training um 
with uh, EFT with oncologists and on, um, oncological uh, clinics mm -hmm. um, and cancer nurses and staff and, and there. So using EFT in that, in fact, that's going to be the focus for EFT International for our research symposium next year is the integration of EFT into the world of patients and treatment and working with those suffering from the effects of cancer. And, and so, yeah, that's an exciting to see what he's doing there and progressing um, how yeah. EFT is integrating into the world. Um, in many different ways like that. So I'm thrilled to hear the work he's doing. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.